We interrupt our regularly scheduled programming with an urgent request that every person watching this channel immediately open your Bible and get ready to understand it. Welcome to The Way, The Truth, and The Life, a program designed to help you better understand your Bible. And now, here is your host, Ken Wade. Welcome, friends, to The Way, The Truth, and The Life broadcast, designed to help you get a little closer to the Bible and the Word of God. And that will mean if you open your Bible with us today, you'll be a little closer to your Maker and know more about what he's about to do here in planet Earth. Did you know that God has a plan? Did you know that you are a part of God's plan? You know, we have such a humdrum everyday existence, we sometimes forget I'm a moving, sentient being. I have the breath of life, a measure of health, and I'm a part of God's plan. Now, what we're going to do with this knowledge that we have today is up to each individual but we're about to enter into the Holy Word of God. So get your Bible, open it up, and read with us, if you would, the words of our Master Jesus in the 23rd chapter of Matthew. May I proceed this by saying, we often think of Jesus as that meek, quiet, humble, lowly, peaceful, loving Son of God. And Jesus was all of those things. We don't always picture him the way we're going to learn about him now. His ministry held not only peace and love and righteous living and teaching and doctrine, but he also had judgment in his ministry. There was a point in his ministry where he took and made a scourge of cords and made a whip and went into the temple, which was supposed to be a house of prayer, and he overturned the tables of the money changers because they were making profit in the house of God, in that holy temple in Jerusalem. And Jesus said, my father's house shall be a house of prayer. Isn't it written that way? So he took that whip and he started whipping people. Now, we don't usually think of the wonderful Lamb of God is having that side of his character, one of judgment and execution of that judgment. But dear friends, what we're about to read in Matthew 23 will certainly show the side of Jesus where he judged rightly so and told the truth. Matthew, the 23rd chapter, starting with the very first verse. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, and that observe and do. But do not you after their works, for they say and they do not. In other words, do as the religious leaders say, but don't do as they do, is what Jesus was saying. The scribes and the Pharisees were the religious leaders of his day. Imagine if one of those religious leaders were listening to what Jesus had to say. And he goes on to say, For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and they lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. These religious leaders were delegators, the higher-ups, the clergy. But all their works they do for to be seen of men, for they make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. And they love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. Oh, I'd like a front row seat if you don't mind. I'm a reverend. Mm-hmm. Jesus said they love greetings in the marketplaces and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi, Master, Master. Be ye not called Rabbi, verse 8, for one is your Master, even Christ. 
and all you are brethren. Did you get what Jesus said? Don't have clergy and laity. All of you are brethren, dear friends. This big thing of clergy and laity. Whoever started that? You want to know who? The Roman church back in the Dark Ages. They had a clergy who owned property and taxed the poor and were in with the politicians and they were in with the civil power, church-state system. And the poor laity were the common, ordinary working folks who had to give to them. No such thing as clergy and laity in my Bible, folks. Look at verse 9, chapter 23, Matthew. Read with me. Call no man father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. In other words, don't call someone on earth by title your spiritual father. He's not talking about earthly, literal fathers. He's talking about spiritual leaders here. Don't call people your master. Don't call people father. Sound familiar? You know how many priests are called father today? Oh, hello, father. They have that reverence. Oh, yes, dear friends. They even call the big one the holy father. Excuse me. There is no holy father but our God. Read it one more time. Maybe it'll sink into the hearts of people who do this every day. Verse 9, chapter 23 of Matthew, Jesus Christ said, Call no man father upon the earth. That's a command of Jesus Christ. For one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Oh, my. How the leaders of great churches and countries wanted the honor and respect and reverential treatment. Hello, reverend. Where did the name reverend come from? The Bible says God is our reverend. Since when do we call a man reverend? I don't know. It started in the dark ages and we're still doing it. Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. You know what abased means? Humbled. God is going to abase these people who exalt themselves. And whosoever humbles himself, if we humble ourselves, we will eventually be exalted. Jesus was exalted to the right hand of God. Why? Because he humbled himself, took upon him the form of a man. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore you shall receive the greater judgment or damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Now, now we're beginning to see how Jesus is talking. We thought he was a quiet, meek little lamb. Well, there was a time when he was a quiet lamb. When he was led to Calvary, he didn't say a word. He was the meek lamb of God. But when it came to telling the truth about the political and religious system of his day, especially the false religious church of his day, he told it like it was, friends. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees! For you devour widows' houses. We have that going on today, folks. People will take the last dime of widows. Some of these television ministers would, wouldn't think twice about taking the little uh, income of widows who are on Social Security. They'd take their last check if they could. Of course, they're making millions. But this is what Jesus is talking about. Devouring widows' houses for a pretense making long prayer. For a big show! But you know what Jesus said? Those fake ministers of the gospel are going to receive the greater damnation. King James, the Bible, the margin of the Bible says judgment. 
In other words, they're going to come under judgment in the judgment day much more severe than other people because here are people that are using the word of God to twist it and make money. And there's so much going on in this TV evangelism that is fake and phony and show business and money making, it's enough to sicken the true people at heart. It's a shame in the name of Jesus Christ that people would even use the Bible with some of their sermons for money. Some of them are practically saying, send your prayers in by check or money order. That's what they're saying on television, half of them. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, for you can pass land and sea to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourself. Woe unto you blind guides which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing, but whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, oh, money, he is a debtor. You fools and blind. This is Jesus Christ talking to the religious leaders of his day. Now get a load of this. It's, it's really almost unbelievable. You fools and blind. For whether is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold. Whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. You fools and blind. For whether is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift. Where's the emphasis today, folks? On the altar or the gold? Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God and by him that sitteth thereon. There Jesus is confirming the fact that God has a throne. And that we're going to come into judgment for what we say, what we do, and how we live and act and how our being goes, he's going to call every single act and word into judgment. So we have to repent, folks. Some of these religious leaders have to repent and realize that they are misusing the name of Christ for money. Verse 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. You blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you may clean the outside of the cup of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Oh, I know in some of these old churches they keep the bones of all these old saints and they put flowers on them. And people's lives are more corrupt than the bones inside those sepulchers. And we pretend to be holy. And we have secret sexual sins. And we pretend to be holy and we drink and we do drugs. And we pretend to be holy and we do this and that. Well, let me tell you something. God knows all about it. And we're in for the greater judgment if we are one of the religious leaders doing these things. God knows. There isn't a secret sin God doesn't know about. And believe me, all of us have had them. And that's why God says, get down on our knees and repent of these sins, folks. It's not people we're trying to impress. It's God Almighty that requires us to repent of our sins. Not so we'll look good before people. We don't want to be men pleasers. We want to be pleasers of God Almighty. Through his blessed son, Jesus, it's possible to receive forgiveness and have, through the blood of Christ, forgiveness. Matthew 23, 28. I didn't write this. I didn't say this. These are the words of Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. Verse 28 of Matthew 23 says, Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men. 
but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Is it possible this is happening today, folks? You know it. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchers of the righteous and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves that you are the children of them that killed the prophets. Fill ye up the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you generation of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? The Greek word damnation is judgment. The Greek word for hell is Gehenna, meaning final judgment, utter punishment, eternal judgment, eternal punishment. And do you know what Gehenna was? You see, there's a problem in the King James Bible sometimes because the word hell comes from different words and different roots. For instance, in the New Testament, you have the word Hades, H-A-D-E-S, which is usually translated hell, and then you have a few times it's from Gehenna, but it's also translated hell, and then you have a third world, a word called Tartarus or Tartaru, which means the atmosphere of the earth where the demons live or are confined, and that's translated hell. So the common reader, unless you have a concordance, can't tell which of the three Greek words you're reading. But in this case, in Matthew 23, verse 33, the word hell comes from Gehenna. Gehenna was a garbage dump outside of Jerusalem, on the south side of Jerusalem. And the fires were kept burning there, and that's where they would pitch the bodies of criminals and all the garbage of the city, and it had a real stench and odor to it. And Jesus pointed to Gehenna, and he said, that is where the religious leaders of his day are going to wind up, because Gehenna was a symbol of final, utter judgment and punishment. Not a place to live, by the way, but a place to utterly be judged and punished forever. Second death, it's called in the book of Revelation. Verse 34, Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify. Notice what Jesus says. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes. The religious leaders have had the best, but some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them you shall scourge in your synagogues, and persecute them from city to city. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah the son of uh, Barachias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come on this generation. Jesus is saying that the religious leaders of his day, dear friends, were like the summation of of all the evil from the righteous blood of the murder of Abel when Cain killed his brother Abel way back in the days of Genesis down way down to the end of the Jewish age in Jesus day when they killed Zacharias and Jesus said for this Jerusalem was going to fall in AD 70 that's what he's talking about. And you know what he said about that fall when Titus came into Jerusalem in A.D. 70? Of course, Jesus died at, at age 33. But he was predicting the judgment for all this false religion. And dear friends, here's what he had to say. And I submit to you that we are facing judgment upon the gateway to God today in this place called Babylon, which is confusion of all these different religions. Everyone's trying to make a buck. Everybody's trying to make more money and breaking into the widow's pocketbooks, giving false prayers, hypocrisy, pretending to be holy and righteous and religious, and it's nothing but a sham and a phony showbiz. Here's what Jesus said. Verse 37 of Matthew 23. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and you would not. 
Jesus tried to save these religious leaders and all the people of Israel, he knew that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed and the temple was going to be leveled. Every stone would be leveled. And he saw this coming and he said, I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her little chickens under her wings. But you didn't want me. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And I submit to Christendom today this mess called churchianity, not Christianity, churchianity. There is a judgment coming which is going to call the, cause the downfall of all these nominal Christian systems, starting with the Vatican and Rome. And all these phony preachers are going to be put out of business and judged by the Almighty God. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. The Jew has been without Christ for nearly 2,000 years. And the day that they say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord, will be the day that Jerusalem is returned to favor of God. And that day is coming, praise God, in that kingdom which is right around the corner. But in the meantime, we have all these fake churches, phony Christianity, and I'm telling you, I can't believe that the people still support it. It's unbelievable. These ministers that guarantee you money by sending them money, it's a crime. It shouldn't be permitted, but we have a free country. We have to permit freedom of speech. So people are gullible enough to go for these uh, sales pitches. They'll have to suffer the consequences. But the preachers are going to be held accountable, the false preachers. I'm not saying there's no good preachers, but the vast majority of this money-making is sin. Jesus didn't have a place to lay his head. Did you know that? Our master didn't even have a bed at night. And some of these ministers live in a supplied home with a supplied car. Some of them even have gold-handled water faucets and dog houses with heaters and air conditioners in them. And they ride in big Cadillac limos with chauffeur-driven bodyguards and everything else. And let me tell you something, that's going to be judged by God. The idea of clergy and laity is a false conception that came from the Dark Age church where the priests dressed different and the common people wore rags. And let me tell you something. On October 31st, we're going to show Martin Luther here. October 31st, 1517 A.D., a man by the name of Martin Luther tacked or hammered 95 things he disagreed with the Roman Catholic Church on, folks. And that was be the beginning of the Protestant protestant reformation and you pan over and you see that uh, to the right there and you'll see Martin Luther was put on trial by the Pope and he had to come in and explain just why have you caused this big upset because Martin Luther was a man of God he was a Roman Catholic priest that couldn't stomach it anymore and so the date October 31st hallowed Eve by the way Halloween October 31st, 1517, this great man of God tacked onto the door of the church at Wittenberg in Germany and changed the course of churchianity and Christianity. And from that day forward, you had protestants, Protestants. Where are the Protestants now? They want to get back and join and become one with the old mother church, don't they? Don't you do it, folks. Martin Luther was sent of God. He was one of the angels of the book of Revelation that was sent to clarify the mighty truths of the Almighty God. Dear friends, October 31st, 1517 will never die in the hearts of the true Christians. That man had to run for his life and hide out in a castle. And you know what he did while he was hiding out? He translated the Word of God into the German language, got it out of the old dead language of the Latin language, which the Catholic Church had kept chained to the priests, wouldn't allow people to read their Bibles, and Martin Luther freed people from the dark ages. And I submit to you as a protestant that you 
should stick to your Protestantism and if you're one and if you're a Catholic, read your Bible and see what it really has to say about these false religions. Shame on Protestants who are fakes. Shame on the Catholic Church that's a fake. Shame on false churchianity. Shame on all of us that are fakes. In the name of Jesus, this is sin. And wake up, minister, because God is calling his saints to, to the rapture very soon. And it may be a lot of words in your mouth, but let's get ready to be there if we're truly God's people. And let's stand for the truth and be willing to tack up on the door of a church if we have to. The truth of God's almighty word. A day of judgment is coming, folks. I want you to write me this week for the Day of Judgment booklet. It's free of charge. It'll introduce you to some of the principles and thoughts concerning what is about to happen in the earth when Christ sets up his new kingdom and the day of judgment or the millennium begins. You know, the millennium is the day of judgment. It's not a 24-hour day. It's a 1,000-year day. And it's going to take 1,000 years. And during that 1,000 years, Christ is going to judge every single human being that ever lived on planet earth. Do you believe that? Do you know about it? Call me right now. You don't have to write, but we'd love to hear from you. But call me. Order the booklet now. Call 734-480-4998. Yes, I get a little excited because the time is near for the end and there's so much false Christianity or churchianity happening. We want to try to let this message get out and tell the truth if we possibly can as long as health lies in us. And the truth lies in us, we hope. Order your book. The day of judgment, it's coming soon, and it's not just a day to fear, it's a day to rejoice in because righteousness is going to be spread over the entire earth. There will be peace on earth, goodwill toward all men because Jesus is going to rule this world with a rod of iron. And you can call me and order your free booklet today at 734-480-4998. That's 734-480-4998. If it's busy, call back. You can call any hour and the, leave your name and address. Ask for the Day of Judgment booklet, and we'll send it to you free tomorrow. And uh, let me know if you get a blessing out of the broadcast or the free booklet and the things we're trying to promote to get the truth out, folks, because the truth isn't popular. But we pray to God that this church uh, message, or this message has been to the true church of Christ. Whatever denomination you find yourself in, dear friend, God loves you and he will free you of the bondage of Babylon. We ask for your prayers, strength, and God bless you. You have been watching The Way, The Truth, and The Life with Ken Wade. If you have enjoyed today's broadcast, please let us know by writing... Ken Wade, Post Office Box 2692, Southfield, Michigan, 48037. This program has been brought to you by Christian Bible Students and is supported wholly by voluntary contributions. Our address again is Ken Wade, Post Office Box 2692, Southfield, Michigan, 48037.